Hello, my name is Tim Shubridge. Welcome to another video about getting into URAC and featuring the System 100 modules from Behringer. Um, now, there were, there were a couple of topics I wanted to talk about in my last video that I ended up just running out of time. Um, so I'm going to hopefully get time to include them in this video, but there's quite a few other things to talk about as well. Those two topics that I missed out on before were uh, using keyboards uh, and MIDI devices with URAC gear. So talking about MIDI to CV converters fundamentally, and also uh, talking about using external effects and the different options that are available for that. Um, but actually, there's something else I want to talk about first. Um, you know, when I was putting together that last video, I was trying to think of interesting um, module combinations to fit into this box. So, you know, what three modules would work well together in a little case like this? Um, and this is one of the first combinations I came up with, but I didn't talk about it at all in the video, and I'll explain why. <laughs> um, you'll see here in the middle, we've got the 110, so that's the single oscillator, filter, and amplifier module. We've got over here on the right-hand side the 140. It's the modulation module, two envelope generators and an LFO. Those really work well together. And then over here on the left-hand side, I've put in here the 112 module. That's the dual VCO module. So what we end up here uh, having here is three oscillators, a low-pass filter, uh, amplifier, two envelope generators, and an LFO, a really powerful, fantastic three oscillator monosynth, basically. And we all love one of those, don't we? So uh, that was my idea um, as, as a, you know, a way of combining three modules. However, it's only when I started to think about how we'd, we'd patch it that I realized that three modules isn't going to be enough uh, because we initially hit some challenges as to how we're going to link these modules together. And so I thought it would be a good thing to talk about those challenges in this video because it's going to be a challenge that you face time and time again when you get into modular gear and Eurorack, um, how to connect stuff up. So we have two fundamental challenges here by having three oscillators in this case. The first thing is we need to give each of the oscillators a control voltage to set its pitch. Now, if we're going to use this as a classic monosynth, we want the same single CV, no matter where it's coming from, from a keyboard or a sequencer or a door or whatever, we want that one same single CV to be applied to each of the three oscillators. We can detune them how we like on the front panel, but we need that same CV. So that's our first challenge is how do we take one single CV and split it basically into three uh, to power the pitches, or set the pitches of our three oscillators. So that's the first challenge. The second challenge is, how do we hear these three oscillators? Uh, so if you look at the 110 module here, the filter section, it's got two audio inputs, um, yet we've got three oscillators. So how do we take the audio outputs from three oscillators, combine them so that we can feed them into this filter and then hear it? Um, so that's the challenges that I want to talk about in this video fundamentally. We'll get onto MIDI to CV and effects if we have time. Um, but we're talking about taking a single CV and splitting it out uh, into sort of multiple outputs to go into multiple inputs fundamentally. And we're talking about taking an audio signal or multiple audio signals and combining them together uh, to pass them into a module. So splitting and combining. And we're going to be talking about multiples or malts, as they're sometimes called, or splitters. And we're going to be talking about mixers. What's the difference between them? When are you going to use them? How can you use them safely? Uh, those kinds of topics. So that's what's coming up in this video. I really do hope you enjoy it. As always, thank you very, very much for watching.
Right, so let's take that first requirement first, the requirement to have a single CV out and apply it to multiple CV ins. Uh, <clears throat> now the simplest way to do that is with one of these cables. It's, uh, I'm just gonna show it to this other camera here, see if I can get it in focus. Uh, I think they're, they're commonly referred to as splitter cables, but they might be called mount cables. Uh, same thing, uh, you know, as well as having a plug on either end, they've also got inbuilt sockets as well. And so the idea is that you just take a, another cable and plug it into the back, so that when this goes into your, your output, you've now got two cables available to you to pass into two inputs. Uh, and of course, you've got another socket here, so you could add a third cable and apply a single uh, output to three inputs and then you could go crazy <clears throat> as many people do you could take one of these guys uh, and you could add another one you could basically stack up these splitter cables as many as you like and have a sort of multi-tentacled monster uh, taking a single output and applying it all over the place and people do do that <clears throat> it's always you know it's always got me wondering how many times can you split a signal uh, into sort of multiple signals, copies of it, uh, before it degrades or before uh, it's unsafe to do so from a power consumption point of view. <clears throat> I've spent a long time on the internet, hours on the internet, looking for advice on the use of splitter cables and multiples in general. Um, and there's no sort of definitive answer. There's no single definitive answer on any of this stuff, uh, which is kind of weird considering uh, that this is, you know, the most basic requirement of all when it comes to Eurorack and modular gear. And I think that the the reason why there's no definitive answer is it all depends on the capabilities of the modules that you're using, the modules that you're taking a signal from, and the modules you're applying that signal to, as to whether it works for you or not, <clears throat> which is a bit unfortunate, really. I can't really give you any definitive answers on these things. Um, but whether it works for you or not... Um, still sort of stacking up all these cables it does create a bit of a you know a spaghetti mess and there are some alternatives to these cables here's one alternative it's a little plastic thing <laughs> splitter malt i don't know what you'd call it but the idea here is that you would pass a signal into it and then you have got one two three four five uh separate outputs um so it's it's a more elegant solution than a whole load of of cables stacked up on top of each other, uh, it achieves the same result. One going to five. And obviously you could then link these up and have multiple ones of these uh, and it could get incredibly complicated. So as well as these things, we also have actual uh, Eurorack modules that do the same thing and those are called MOLTs or multiples. Um, I'll pick up put up a picture of the 173 from Behringer in the System 100 series. I've got one of those. It's really, really useful. It's a very elegant solution. Uh, you know, it's. I think it's far easier to see how you patch something uh, and to alter that patch with a sort of a Eurorack module malt rather than using splitter cables and, and these little star-shaped things. Um, I'll show you a few other examples of uh, of malt modules to show you how small they can be. Here is uh, a little tiny, tiny, thin little one from Dreadbox. There's three separate circuits there on that one. Here's another example. Uh, this one's from Erica Synths. There are two. Get in the middle. There are two separate circuits there. One has two outputs, and the other malt has three outputs. Uh, <clears throat> here's a a very sophisticated malt. It's actually called a switchable malt. Uh, each of those sockets, you can switch which malt circuit. You've got a choice of a couple of circuits there, which circuit each of those sockets belongs to. Uh, so that's a complex one. Uh, here's another one. This is from uh, Pittsburgh Modular. It's actually got a malt here at the top. And then these two guys are mixers. And that's another important subject to talk about, the difference between malts and mixers and when you'd want to use them. Uh, again, there's no definitive answers on that topic either, but I will cover it uh, in a little while in this video. Uh, but if we come back to these uh, two first malt modules that I showed you, the, the one from Dreadbox and the one from Erica Synths, uh, there's actually a fundamental difference between them 
I'm not talking about the number of modules and number of sockets. I'm talking about when we turn it over, uh, you'll see a difference. Now this one here, <clears throat> you can clearly make out, it's just a bunch of sockets all hardwired together. There's no special processor there. There's no power requirement. Uh, it's just hardwired. It's like a bunch of splitter cables. And this kind of multiple is called a passive multiple. It's just hardwired connections, hardwired sockets. That's all it is. As opposed to this one, which when I turn it over, you'll see it's a bit more complicated. Uh, there's some chips there on a circuit board and there is a power socket. Yeah. Uh, and this is what's called a powered or a buffered or active multiple. Uh, and there's a fundamental difference between them. Uh, a buffered powered uh, multiple is one that's got some processing going on that will take your input signal and as accurately as possible replicate it across the outputs that it has. Whereas uh, a passive multiple is just purely a bunch of sockets hardwired together and there's a difference between them. <clears throat> so what I'm going to try and do for you now is demonstrate an issue with passive mults and splitter cables as to why you might need to use a buffered multiple and that's what's coming up next. Okay, so I'm now going to attempt to demonstrate to you the issue with using splitter cables or passive malts, which are the same thing. Uh, when it comes to splitting out a CV signal, which is then going to affect the pitch of an oscillator, for example. So here I've got my 110 module. Um, I've got this blue cable coming out, which is just the audio out, going into a mixer, and then it's going off to my amplifier and recorder. That's just so we can hear it like that. And I've got a red cable, which is going into the mod in of the VCO section. So this is going to be affecting the pitch. The little attenuator is turned up to maximum. And this red cable is coming from this little Erica Synths MIDI to CV converter module that I've got, got over here. Um, this black cable is a MIDI cable, and it's ultimately connected to my keyboard here. So let's just turn up the gain. Um, and you'll hear... that it's, it's, it's pretty much in tune and it's tracking the keyboard well. Um, I could fine tune it even more, but it's good enough for our uh, experiment here. So that's all fine, but I'm gonna take this CV cable uh, and rather than go directly into the oscillator, I'm gonna go via one of these malts in this Behringer 173 module. Now this is a faithful recreation of the original Roland 173. Uh, it's got these four gates at the top here, which, to be honest with you, are a subject of a, of a completely different video for another day. And it's got six multiples down here, which are really, really handy to have. Um, but just like on the Roland uh, original System 100M, these are passive multiples. They're not powered, which is a little bit odd considering that this whole card is actually powered. But these are passive. So I'm going to take this CV and I'm going to put it into the bottom malt. Then I'm going to take a cable and I'm going to go out of the malt and then straight back into the oscillator. So hopefully there shouldn't be any difference by doing that. CV out into malt, out from malt into oscillator. So let's hear what that sounds like. be tracking okay I don't think there's any difference there's no audible difference not to me anyway okay however let's use this malt and let's take another cable take one of the other outputs from the malt now here I've got a 112 module dual VCO module we're not going to hear those VCOs uh, it could be any module it doesn't matter I just need a module that's that has some inputs that I'm going to use. I'm going to basically just consume the signal that's now coming out of this cable. I'm going to put it into uh, this VCO here. So we're now consuming a second output from the malt that we've got here. Let's hear what that now sounds like. actually 
actually a bit flat. It's not noticeable down here, down this lower end. But up here, it's flat. If I pull it out, you'll hear there's a definite increase in pitch. Basically what that means is by using a second cable out of this passive malt here, the voltage that's reaching this VCO to set its pitch is actually slightly lower than it should be. Uh, let's keep on going with the experiment and let's use this last output from the malt here. So one more cable. And I'm gonna consume the signal with this third VCO here. Like that. Now let's listen to it. terribly out of tune, really, really flat now. <laughs> it's bad. Let me unplug it. There's the difference. Same as unplugging this one. Basically, the more we split the signal out into separate sort of inputs uh, further on in our Eurorack setup here, uh, the worse the situation gets. Now, I'm not an electrical engineer. You're going to hear me say that a million times in these videos. So I can't tell you the technical reason why this is happening. But in layman's terms, this signal here um, is actually getting weakened every time we split it out further and consume it further. And it kind of makes sense that that's what's happening. Um, and it's showing by the fact that the voltage is being slightly reduced every single time. Now, the way that we can get around this is to sort of alter this in some way, um, amplify it basically. If we were to amplify this, so this is more than one volt per octave, then we can sort of like compensate for the sort of reduction in voltage that's occurring here by splitting the signal out these three times. However, there is um, a solution that I found, I just stumbled across it anyway, uh, and that is using this module here, which is a 297 module. I haven't talked about it before. Um, the Roland System 100M didn't have a 297. This is actually uh, the conjoining of two separate modules by bearing it into one. We've got a dual mixer module and a dual portamento module and Beringer have managed to fit both of those onto one card and they've given it the name 297 by adding the, the numbers together. Um, now if we use one of these mixers here, we don't, we're not going to do anything special with this signal at all. I'm just going to put it into this bottom mixer and then I'm going to take an output from that mixer and put it into the malt as the input to the malt. So I'm not amplifying the signal at all. I'm not doing anything special with it. I'm not mixing it with anything else. I'm just passing it into the mixer and out again. And now let's listen to the effect. It solved it. Um, and again, I'm not an electrical engineer. I can't tell you the technical reason why, but I think in layman's terms, what's happening is that this signal coming out of the Erica Sense MIDI to CV converter is a weak signal. Um, it can't get split more than you know twice before we start to see a, a sort of a serious degradation in it. But by passing into this mixer uh, and then just taking the output, it's a more robust signal, can I say it like that? Uh, a more powerful signal, I don't know how to describe it technically, but this signal is far more robust and is not being affected by being split out three times. Um, I think eventually, you know, if we were to split it out four, five, six, seven, eight, nine times or whatever, we'd end up with the same issue that we saw before, but it's enough of a boost in the signal 
um, to allow us to use a passive malt for the purposes of setting a pitch. So that is my solution using Behringer modules to this issue. Uh, this issue with these passive malts, it's not a Behringer issue, it's not an issue with the System 100 module, it's just a fact of life when you're using passive malts and splitter cables. So hopefully you heard there in that demonstration, sorry there are fireworks going on because it is New Year's Eve. I don't know why I'm sitting here doing this video. It's New Year's Eve. There's no way I can go. That's the reason why. Anyway, uh, hopefully you heard in that demonstration um, that there is a reason why uh, passive malts and therefore splitter cables might not work. And I say might not. Uh, it all comes down to the modules that you're patching from and to. So you could see there that the EricaSynth MIDI to CV converter uh, couldn't cope with its signal being split into three, uh, whereas the mixer circuit and the Behringer module could cope with it. So it all comes down to the modules that you're using and their capabilities. So there is no sort of like hard and fast rules with any of this stuff. Um, and then that brings us on to the next challenge that I mentioned before, which is taking multiple audio outputs and combining them into one or two uh, signals that we can pass into the filter. So why can't I use uh, something like this to do that? Why can't I take, take this, pass two audio signals into it, and then take the combined signal out of it? Uh, and again, unfortunately, this is where you'll find uh, that there is no definitive answer to that question. Uh, you'll have sort of like a, a whole spectrum of views on this. On the one side, you'll have the people that say, no, don't do that. Because at the end of the day, by doing that, you're fundamentally, I'll use this camera, you're fundamentally, if you plug those two into separate outputs, you're fundamentally short-circuiting them. And that's something you shouldn't do. You shouldn't be connecting an out to another out in your Eurorack modular gear or semi-modular gear at all. Uh, it's not something that you should be doing. Um, and then at the other end of the spectrum, you'll have people that say, heck, go and do it. It may or may not work. If it works, good luck, well done. At the end of the day, all Eurorack gear these days is idiot-proof. Uh, you can't short-circuit anything. Just go ahead and do it. It's not a problem. Well, to be honest with you, you know, over the last couple of years, I've been using Eurorack gear. Uh, on more occasions than I will care to uh, admit to, I have plugged the wrong cable, well, the wrong end of a cable into the wrong socket. Um, I have plugged an output into an output, and then I've gone, well, why can't I hear the sound that I, I'm expecting? Oh, shit, I've plugged it in the wrong place. Let's plug it in the right place. I've done that so many times, and I haven't blown up anything. Um, and I felt a bit stupid about it, but I think it's a mistake that a lot of us make. Um, and yes, Eurorack gear these days is idiot-proof. It should be idiot-proof. There's this sort of circuit protection uh, that is built into every module so that you can't blow them up. Um, but that having been said, if there is a simple alternative um, to using multiples and short-circuiting your outputs, then you should probably use them. Um, and that's where I'm coming back to this uh, Pittsburgh Modular module that I showed you uh, earlier on in the video. This one here, it's got a malt at the top and it's got two mixers at the bottom here. This malt is expecting one single input and it'll give you up to three outputs, whereas these mixers will give you, uh, they're expecting two inputs and they'll give you two outputs for each of these mixers. Uh, these mixers are not going to short circuit your inputs at all. Uh, they're designed to mix signals, not to split them. And uh, a little module like this is really, really cheap, very, very cheap. And there's lots and lots of little mixers out there, even ones with little attenuators, so you can mix, you know, uh, to your heart's content. Uh, I think it's worthwhile using mixers 
for combining signals um, whenever you can rather than sort of trying your luck with splitter cables or with multiples. Right, so the snippets of music that you're hearing throughout this video, I composed them and recorded them into my door into Cubase. Um, so I'm recording the MIDI data. Uh, and then in terms of the sounds, uh, I'm setting them up one patch at a time on the System 100, uh, recording the audio one track at a time, uh, and, and then building up the track that way. And that's how I've ended up integrating Eurorack into my, uh, my setup here, really just treating the Eurorack setup as yet another synthesizer. Um, I much prefer to use uh, and, and do sequencing inside my door. It's just what I'm used to. It's what I'm quickest at doing, uh, and it, it maintains the sort of like the creativity for me, uh, rather than having to fiddle around with with little sequences, standalone sequences, and, and you know spend most of your time tuning them. Um, so that's just my preference. It clearly won't be your preference. Uh, we all you know we're all different in that respect. Um, but my approach requires that I use a MIDI to CV converter. You know, I'm sequencing from my door one track at a time. I need to turn my MIDI into CV and gate to drive my Eurorack. So we saw the Erica Synths uh, CV, uh, sorry, MIDI to CV module a little bit earlier. It's a really nice little module. I've had it for quite a long time. Uh, it's very small in, in the rack, it doesn't take up much room. Um, it supports monophonic and duophonic playing, which is really handy to have. Um, it's got its own master tune control, which is very handy, and it's got a glide control as well. So it's a really nice module, uh, but there are loads of modules out there, and you know the more um, recent modules that have been released are really quite sophisticated in terms of what they can do. So I've got through quite a few uh, different MIDI to CV converters uh, in the last two years that I've been into Eurorack. Uh, I think it's four or five different modules um, going from, you know, out outgrowing them basically, going from one level of sophistication to the next, to the next, to the next. Uh, for quite a while, this one here was my absolute favorite. It was the one that I sort of standardized on. It's by Mutable Instruments. It's called Yarns. Uh, as you'll see on the front panel here, there are four pairs of outputs, so four pairs of CV and gate. So it can support uh, four note paraphony and four note polyphony, which is really fantastic. It's got lots of different configurations. Um, it, it does unison modes, mono modes, uh, paraphonic, duophonic, and polyphonic modes. Um, you know, th th that's the thing with uh, MIDI to CV converters. It's all about the firmware that's inside them. You know, they're 100% they firmware in here. Uh, firmware has to decide how to um, process the MIDI messages that it receives, uh, how to determine what notes to play, in what order to play them, in what precedence. Uh, it's all about the firmware. So, you know, that's a, a sort of like a, a double-sided sword. It does mean that there can be bugs in, in these modules but it also does mean that the firmware is updatable um, and as well as fixing bugs, manufacturers also come out with new features. Now, with this Yarns module here, um, originally when I got it, it supported one, two, and four uh, voice modes in paraphonic, polyphonic, uh, unison, etc. Um, but with a firmware update, they added three note paraphonic mode to it. Uh, and just because of that update, and because now I could play three note paraphonic uh, playing with this module, uh, it allowed me to use the uh, Dreadbox Erebus version 3 and do some uh, three note paraphonic playing on that particular synthesizer.
So it's actually only been in the last few months that I've kind of outgrown this module, the Mutable Instruments Yarns. Uh, I've ended up replacing it with another one. I'll show a picture of it here. Uh, it's by Polyend and it's called the Poly2. Now this module is an absolute monster of a module. It's so sophisticated, it supports up to eight note polyphonic playing. It supports MPE and all that kind of thing. It really has got loads of capabilities inside it. I've been using it for the last few months and it's incredible. It's worth every single penny. Uh, I mean, if I can give you any advice at all about your choice of MIDI to CV converter, uh, it would be kind of similar advice to you know, choosing your first case to put your modules in. You really need to do a little bit of crystal ball gazing. Think about the medium term, think about what modules you're likely to have, think about the music you're going to make with those modules, how you, you, you envisage controlling them, you know, how important is MIDI to you, how important is polyphonic playing or paraphonic playing to you, uh, how important is playing your modules multi-timbrally, uh, because all of those things will you know, help steer you as to which of the many modules out there to, to get. Um, you know, it might be worth investing that little bit more, getting a more sophisticated module today. You might not need all that sophistication today, um, but it'll you know, put you in good stead for the future. That's something to think about. Right, so with our knowledge now of malts and mixers and having had a look at MIDI to CV converters as well, let's take a look at what my ideal three oscillator monosynth, uh, let's see what it now looks like. Uh, so here it is, uh, we've got the three original modules here at the top um, and underneath we've got, through necessity, uh, we've got a couple of mixers, we've got some malts, I've got my amplifier for sending the signal out uh, and obviously I've got my MIDI to CV converter as well. So in the end, it ends up being three, four, five, six, seven modules rather than just three. Um, but you know, the whole idea about uh, modular, as I keep banging on about and getting a bit boring about, uh, is the fact that it's extendable, expandable. You know, you can use these for this particular setup, then rearrange things and, you know, create a completely different uh, synthesizer out of the modules that you've got. So uh, let's just have a quick look at how it's patched, um, just to confirm all that. So we've got this grey cable here, which is the CV out of my MIDI to CV converter. It's going into a mixer purely so that I can boost the signal and pass it into this malt here. And then I've got these three uh, rather colourful cables coming out of that malt, going into the oscillators to set their pitches. Uh, so that's as I described before. Uh, and in terms of the audio output from those oscillators, I'm taking all three of those audio outs, going into a mixer and using it as a real mixer this time, setting the levels how I want, and then I've got an output from that mixer going into my filter. So that's my audio routing worked out with these three oscillators, and that's my CV uh, inputs with the three oscillators. Uh, what else have I got going on here with this patch? Um, in terms of the gate that's coming out of the MIDI CV converter, that's this little red cable. It's going into another malt because I need to take that gate and use it to tr trigger my envelopes. And I'm also using it to trigger uh, my LFO, and I'll come on to that in a minute. So the red cable is going into this malt, and I've got these three uh, white or grey cables coming out, uh, triggering each of the envelopes and the LFO. So that's another reason for using a malt. Um, I don't care about you know, the slight degradation that there may be uh, with the signal because at the end of the day I'm just driving envelope generators, triggering them, triggering them. I'm not setting pitches or anything uh, precise like that. Uh, so that's that malt uh, and the envelopes. And then I'm taking the, uh, the CVs that the envelopes generate. Uh, this top one is a dedicated amplitude envelope and the one below it is a dedicated filter envelope. So it's a very, very standard way of patching the synth, uh, typical sort of uh, three 
uh, oscillator monosynth patching. Uh, nothing special going on there. There's one more thing I wanted to do, which was to patch in the LFO. Um, so I'll just take an output from the LFO. I want to use a little bit of vibrato with this LFO. And that's a really good uh, reason for actually taking the CV uh, and putting it into this mixer. Although I'm not using it as a, as a real mixer at the moment, uh, I can do by just taking this uh, LFO CV, uh, adding it into the mixer, and then just turning it up just enough to give the amount of vibrato that I want. So if I play a note, I turn it up. There you go. And this LFO has got a, uh, a delay slider on it. Uh, so it'll delay the onset of the LFO kicking in, which is really nice. with that. So that's it, that's my three uh, oscillator monosynth setup. Um, okay, so in terms of cost, uh, I haven't worked that one out. Um, I'll, I'll do so, but we're, we're talking about one, two, three, four, five, six, seven modules. Let's say they're, you know, uh, they're a hundred pounds each. Um, which they're not, some of them are cheaper. Um, so let's say they're seven, 700 pounds, UK pounds for the modules. Uh, and then we've got the cases, let's say it's a couple of hundred pounds worth of cases here. Um, even if you were to put them in a, you know, a one big case rather than these little wooden cases, uh, you're still talking about a couple of hundred pounds. Let's say, just be generous, and let's say this is a thousand pounds in total for what you can see here. Um, you know, what are the alternatives for a three oscillator, purely analog monosynth? Um, and obviously we can drive this and make it geophonic. If we repatched it, it could be a, a geophonic synth as well. Uh, there aren't that many choices of three oscillator monosynths and, and geophonic synths out there. Um, and, but I'm sure you can, you know, I'm thinking of one particular one ending in the letter D, uh, which is going to end up being an awful lot cheaper than buying all of this kit here. Um, but it all depends on what you want, you know, at the risk of sounding boring, um, I keep saying it, but you know, Eurorack is extendable, expandable, it's highly configurable, it's, ha it's what you want it to be. All of these modules here can be used uh, for whatever other purpose that we want to in the future. Um, you know, you buy them once and then use them how you want to over and over and over again. Uh, and, you know, and the other reason why I, I really like this setup is because it, it is so analog. It is 100% analog. You know, we've got voltage-controlled oscillators, a voltage-controlled filter, a voltage-controlled amplifier. Uh, the mixers here are pure analog mixers. There's no digital to audio conversion going on at all. Analog mixers. We've got an analog amplifier here down on the bottom right. The only digital control that's going on here is the MIDI to CV converter, and that's by necessity. It has to be digital. That's the only digital module that we've got here. Everything else is analog. Even the envelope generators are analog envelopes, and the LFO is just another voltage control oscillator. So, you know, you're getting as close as you possibly can here to, uh, you know, vintage, pure analog circuit designs, uh, but obviously a, a modern remake of those vintage designs. Uh, and that for me is very, very appealing.